Hello. So, in this video, we're going to be tackling the product rule. So, we went through the sum and difference rules, right, and even constant multiple rules, and we found that the limit laws sort of translated very nicely, right, pretty much direct verbatim for derivatives. Turns out, as we sort of mentioned toward the end there, that taking a derivative of a product of functions is unfortunately not as simple. And in order to sort of make this work, we're going to be needing to use the dreaded technique of adding zero cleverly. So we'll see where that comes in. But again, as usual, sort of a, as a good place to start, we can just sort of write down what we're after, right? Use the, the difference quotient and see how, you know, what happens. So if we just sort of naively plug this thing in, so we're looking at the function f of x times g of x, right? So then we plug in the x plus delta x piece for both and then minus that specific x value uh, afterward or general x value. And then we have it all over that delta x as delta x goes to zero. Now, I have claimed, right, without any justification thus far, <laughs> I have claimed that the product rule doesn't sort of just translate directly from limits, but sort of since we've seen it work with sums and differences in constant multiples, it is worth sort of just trying it and see what happens, right? So it worked well before, it's worth at least trying to see if it works well now. So if that were the case, right, we want to ask like, okay, then is the derivative of f of x times g of x just this f prime g prime? Because that's what it would have, that's what it would do if the limits sort of went through nicely. Unfortunately, we can see this isn't the case by just doing sort of a simple test case. So what if f of x is x, g of x is x? Now, these are sort of nice ones to pick, right? Because they're very easy to find the, the derivatives, right? If I think, okay, what's the derivative of f of x? I could do a polynomial rule or power rule, um, or I could just think like derivative is the slope and these are lines, so the slope is one, right? So both of these have derivative one. So I'm just keep that in the back of your head for a second. Now, <clears throat> if I want to do the derivative of f of x times g of x, that's right, that's what this is saying is take the derivative with respect to x of f of x times g of x. Well, that's just the derivative of x times x, right? Because they're both x, which means it's the derivative of x squared, which using your polynomial rule is 2x. Okay. The other direction, we just said, okay, well, the derivative of f is one and the derivative of g is one. So f prime times g prime is one times one, that's one. So on the one hand, I have that the derivative is two x. On the other hand, I have the derivative is one and shockingly, those things are not equal, <laughs> right? So I can't claim that uh, doing the derivative of the product is just taking the product of the derivatives because here's an example where that doesn't work, okay? So, Unfortunately, this is not the case. I, I wish it were, it would make life much easier in all kinds of ways, but it's not. So here's where we need to do this adding zero cleverly bit. And really this is one of those sort of magic out of, you know, taking a rabbit out of a hat moments that seems to come out of absolutely nowhere. We're going to add and subtract F of X plus Delta X times G of X to the top of our overall difference quotient, okay? So returning back to our original difference quotient, um, so this is the, the original piece that we had, right? With the uh, putting in the x plus delta x for our f times g and then just x. And here is our um, adding and subtracting our term. So here we've added f of x plus delta x times g of x, and we've also subtracted it. So we've added zero, meaning that we haven't changed our expression at all, but we've introduced this extra term. Now, it is a perfectly reasonable thing, you know, like as a student looking at this going, why on earth would we add and subtract that, that expression, right? And, and as I said, like, it is a bit of a rabbit out of a hat. And the very unsatisfying way of answering that would be, well, because it works, but that's not very helpful for anybody. 
the real reason that we chose this particular thing, this f of x plus delta x times g of x, is actually very, very nuanced. But the sort of way of thinking about it, the way of sort of seeing why this has some possibility of working, is that in our original ex expression, we had these very different terms. We had stuff that was all in terms of x plus delta x and stuff that was only in terms of x. And so what we're doing is we're introducing a bridging term. Um, so this bridging term has some of each of those. And the hope is that this will let us sort of find a middle sort of ground between the two points for factoring purposes and for some sort of, you know, way of getting these things to relate to each other, which is exactly, as it turns out, what happens. So if you're like, I don't think I would think of this, don't feel bad. This is why it took hundreds of years to come up with these things, is that uh, somebody had to be very clever and sort of try it and find out that it works. And it's only in retrospect that we sort of realized that that's what we needed to be done. Okay. So once we've added and subtracted these things, um, we're going to regroup these terms. That's all that's happening here, is that I've taken these, this first bit here, and I've included that minus term in with that first bit, and I've included the positive term that I added in with that, that second last bit, okay? Now, I have, since I have two grouped pieces, I'm going to factor out any common terms between them. So, in particular, in this first one, I have an f of x plus delta x in both. And in the second one, I have a g of x in both. And this is why this worked out so well, is that it has a piece of each of them. That's why it's a nice bridging term, is it lets me factor each grouping because my middle term had a piece that goes sort of with each part, okay? We'll see why that's helpful in a second here. Um, so now I'm just splitting over this addition, right? So I had these grouped pieces and these grouped pieces. In some sense, I'm thinking that these things are sort of separately useful. So I am splitting my limit over that sum. Okay, so now I split this first piece over this product, right? So I, I pull out my f of x plus delta x because that piece is sort of defined on its own perfectly fine. And I notice that this piece, right, when I look at the limit, this thing should look pretty familiar, right? This is sort of a classic difference quotient for G. Similarly, this is a, a classic difference quotient for F, so I want to isolate that. And the claim is that I can pull this G of X out, quote unquote, as a constant multiple. Now this might seem very strange because G of X is a function, it's not a constant. But the thing to remember is that what is constant is not sort of what we think of just abstract mathematically. I'm not talking about this is a constant value. I'm talking about it's constant in terms of what the limit cares about. The limit cares about this delta x, and there's no delta x in this term. So from the limit's perspective, as the limit is changing delta x, the g of x doesn't change. That's why it's considered a constant multiple. And this this idea of having a function still act sort of constant because of the way that the limit sort of isn't uh, addressing that directly. And this is something that comes up more in this class a, a few times, several times, uh, but it comes up a lot if you take survey of calc two um, or regular calculus two, and it comes up an awful lot when you look at calc three. So depending on where you might be going forward, this is potentially a really key idea um, in other future math classes but also in this class, uh, we'll do this a few more times, okay? So finally, since I split these, I can do just the limit of this first bit, right? Remember, we can't partially uh, evaluate limits, so I couldn't do the limit like up here. I couldn't do just the limit of f of x plus delta x. I have to split it before I can do a partial, like before I can actually do just that piece. So that's what I did, right? And f of x is just a perfectly nice thing, right, it's a differentiable function, which means it's continuous. So that means that this delta x going to zero is just equivalent to having it be f of x. But that leaves over, right, this leaves this piece, which looks like a nice difference quotient, and this piece, which looks like a nice difference quotient. So I can turn those into our sort of classic nice condensed prime notation. And that ends me with this piece here, right? So 
I started by trying to figure out what the difference quotient of this f of x, g of x thing was. And I ended with, eventually, a relatively nice compact expression, okay? So derivative law, what do we get sort of out of this? What this told us is that if we want to take the derivative of a product, it's unfortunately not quite as nice as we would have liked. You know, it's not, it's not f prime g prime, but it's close. I mean, it's a reasonably nice thing. Um, so it's this f prime times g of x plus f of x times g prime. Now, because it's not straightforward, you might sort of worry, okay, what about the order or whatever? Uh, but remember, addition and multiplication, these things are commutative, meaning I can do it in any order. So it actually doesn't matter what order you remember or write this down in. Either way, it's going to work as long as you make sure that each of the sort of resulting pieces that you write down, this f prime g, f times g prime, as long as you mem remember that each of these terms has to have one factor that's the original function, right, either g of x or f of x, and the other factor is the derivative of the other function. So if you write down f of x, then the other one has to be g, the other function, and specifically the derivative, g prime. But I could write this down as, you know, g of x times f prime plus f times g prime, or I could write it down as f times g prime plus f prime times g. Like I can, I can mix up which one I write down as long as they still are paired together correctly. And it'll still work because addition and multiplication don't care about the order. And it turns out that this is actually going to be pretty nice because we won't always have that fact. <laughs> So what do we do? So although it turns out the derivative law for products isn't quite as nice as we'd like, it's actually not that bad. Um, in particular, like we, we sort of derived it, uh, you know, made the proof by doing this nice adding by adding zero cleverly step that is not at all obvious, doing some very careful factory manipulation. But at the end of the day, we came up with this derivative of derivative of the product being the sum of these two things, right? f prime g and g prime f, in whichever order you want to put them in. Um, and this sort of the nice thing is that this rule is stated entirely using commutative operations, and that's deceptively nice because that makes it really sort of hard to not remember it slightly and get something wrong, right? Like if you mix up the order when you remember it, it'll still be correct as long as you sort of make sure that one piece is, has a derivative and the other piece doesn't and they're different functions. As said, this won't always be the case. For example, looking forward, uh, when we do the quotient rule, their order is gonna make a big difference. Um, so we'll see sort of how that goes in, a, in another video, okay? So that's that.